Hello and welcome to the Car Kernel channel and welcome to a car that you all have been asking for since it kind of came in the shop and sat in the background. Folks, this is a 1988 Toyota Supra, the one, the original proper Supra and the one that makes my heart just wants to write a check and buy it. I love these things. I've owned multiple of them and this is there's just a special relationship with me and this car. Now, this car, apart from it being the car that I have a special relationship with and a car that I absolutely love, this car has a beautiful story. So this is not a one-owner car. The original owner bought it short period of time, then the current owner bought it in the late 80s, and they've owned it ever since. Now, the thing about this car is the owner bought it, enjoyed it, drove it a lot, but then family got in the way, life, so he started driving it less and less, and it became kind of the secondary fun car until the car had issues. They've already replaced an engine on it, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But then there was a period where the car just sat, had a lot of problems. They were not through, the biggest drive was just around the block and back, and this is where the car has been. It's basically been sitting for a while, not really driven anything proper driving. And the father, who is the owner of this car, wants to restore this car for his son, for his son to live the same memories he have lived with this car all over again, since his son is going to be started driving soon. I think this is a beautiful story of a very nice guy that owns this car. And this is where car guys, we get our flame, if you would. We love these cars and we love kind of to relive the memories and have our kids relive our memories all over again. This is a very nostalgic moment for me because my 1989 Toyota Supra was my second car. After my first car finally decided to go away, got stolen actually, this was my second car, 1989 Supra. It was slightly different, but it was a turbocharged engine. This was not, but these Supras, they are not reliable, but they are epic. This is the kind of car you put up with when they're not reliable. Let's get the video rolling. Let's check this thing out. We'll put it on the lift. We'll talk about what the action plan for this one is right after this. Let's take a look at this car. And the first thing I wanted to this say is uh, the key. It's been a minute now we've seen keys like this, just a little metal thing. It is actually the original key. It's really hard to show, but it does say Toyota on it. And it's completely worn, of course. Uh, pretend I didn't say that, but you can start these cars usually with a screwdriver. Pretend I didn't say that. First thing is, this car has been painted. Unfortunately, not the best paint job in the world. And it's sitting, having mold and mildew all over it is not helping this case. These were stolen. That just happens, unfortunately. The door handle is cracked, but it still works. And something about these doors, when they open, you can use this as a traffic stop, basically, because you open this massive door uh, you can almost stop the traffic. This is something with these doors. That's just how they were. There's one thing nostalgic, and if you, you are into these cars, this uh, window switch right here is super rare to have it standing in one shape. Usually these break. And of course, this one, this particular one, goes down. It's really tricky to go back up. You have to keep pressing it just the right way. And then the mirror also is broken a little bit over here. Not a huge deal, but you know, these are fixed mirrors. Actually, the one I had back home had foldable mirrors. Overseas, they had foldable mirrors in the US. They were fixed. The interior of this car is timeless to me. I love this interior. I know you see it, oh, it's just a car from the 80s. This is a beautiful, beautiful interior. I mean, let's look at some of the, some of the details here. First, you have that cockpit look. And some cars are starting to mimic that again. And then you have these extreme 80s seats. Not just the color, just the design. And there's something cool about these seats. So this, arm, this headrest has multiple positions. This is one, two, three, and four, and then it goes back. Very, very comfortable car. Now, the bolsters, they also move. This button right here, that moves your bolsters. 
very cool and of course you can start this car without the key with a screwdriver but in the uh, current times that is your best alarm manual transmission not a lot of people actually fortunately drive tra manual transmission these days so that's your best alarm right there now this car has 115,000 miles which is actually not a lot for these you'll find them with a lot higher miles and they're still okay the dash surprisingly has no cracks this is super common for these this is a target top so these uh this roof can be removed not my favorite option in the world in these because they really shake when you do that but that's how it is and of course what uh we cannot talk about the Supra without the, talking about the most important thing, the coin holder right here. This is uh, the 80s for you. And another thing is you have a little tiny little AC vent right there just to make sure you're all cool and warm. Other thing is in this car, unfortunately, the carpet have seen better days, but that's, that's how it is with these cars. Center console could use a refresh the lid is broken to the side and the leather is gone again super common stuff with these nothing out of the ordinary let's pop the hood let's take a look at what's underneath it and something of a Supra special every Supra will come with a little wooden stick that you're going to use to hold the hood up because I don't remember the last Supra that actually had working hood shocks this one, of course, included. Now, how can we talk about the Supra without talking about the iconic pop-up headlights? Battery, of course, is dead. We'll jump it in a little bit and you'll see them, but love these. Did you know that there is a little motor adjustment right here where you can uh, turn it and the lights will come up once I find the right direction. There we go. It's a very slow and agonizing process to do that but you can actually raise the lights like that if you have half a day to do this you can do the little lazy eye thing that was a thing back back in the time but let's put this one back now let's talk about the biggest thing this is the 7m engine this is such a, I don't want to say an icon, because this was the time where Toyota were experimenting. Let's say that Toyota was a very, very different company back then. They were not as big. They did not have the resources they do today. They, uh, things were different. Let's put it this way. So the 7M, a good engine, it does have a few problems. And the worst of these problems is when you put a turbo on it the way it sits factory. And that's exactly what Toyota did. They designed this, then they realized, hmm, this is our halo sports car. We needed to make more power. So they just took this engine, made a few modifications, put a turbo and called it a day. Now this is not the turbo variant of that. This is the non-turbo variant of that. And it has one problem that I'm gonna give you two seconds to go in the comment and comment if you know anything about these engines. What do you think this engine has? Yes, you already commented it, you know it. Blown head gasket. This is what possibly plagued this engine. I mean, this engine was such a good engine. It's so quiet and smooth and, and refined and it really had a lot of technology for the time. But it could never hold its head gasket. There's a lot of theories why that is. Some people say it's because of the EGR. Some people say because the torque spec was not sufficient. There was a lot of theories. But in the end, if you own a 7M, one way, shape, or form, you will have a blown head gasket for one reason or another. It's just one of their things. Now, let's talk about some of the relics in this engine, because if you are younger and you don't remember those days, well, let us remind you of those days. This, my friends, is a good old distributor. And these are spark plug wires. Things were completely different in those days. And... Uh, this actually, and some of the, I hope there are some older Toyota technicians watching. This is the worst nightmare. This is the first early iteration of a mass airflow. So this has a big door that opens 
as airflow is coming in and there's a sensor here that picks it up. Door always sticks. If I'm not mistaken, BMW had similar design. And door would stick and we have all kinds of problems. And then this is the earliest form of a charcoal canister right here. This is uh, very old stuff. And if you look here, the wiper motor is actually right here. This engine has a sea of vacuum hoses and things that look extremely complicated. This behemoth over here is the cruise control and there is vacuum modulators and there's a lot. All this is a completely obsolete because all this has been replaced by electronics, which despite what people say, they work a lot better than all these maze of cables, and vacuum hoses, and all kinds of stuff. So this car needs a, blow, needs a head gasket. And after much deliberation, this engine is going to need not really a rebuild because it runs fine. This car runs and drives, by the way. It does not just, it's not just been sitting and everything is rotten. But this is the second engine on this car. So the original engine, you guessed it, blow and head gasket. At that time, these engines were so cheap, you just buy them off Japan, you know, imported engine. It's much cheaper just to put another engine. That's what they did. And this engine has 10,000 miles on the swap. Right around 10, 15,000, somewhere around there. And here we go again, because the engine they put in it also had the same problem. And here we go again. Now, this engine is at the very early stages of that. It hasn't overheated. It got a little hot a few times. Heat is not good. You have the puff of smoke, white smoke. It kind of stutters. It's not full power. So it's not to a point where completely everything's warped and it's been overheated multiple times. There is hope. But this car needs a lot more than that. And in order to do this car justice, we're going to put it on the lift. Let's check it out because this is actually something that got okayed by the customer. We're going to actually do but parts are a whole different conversation. Let's pull the car on the lift, let's look at it, and we'll go from there. Well, since the battery is dead, let's put a jumper pack here, and we're gonna have to drive it with the jumper pack, because this, uh, it puffs, and it puffs a lot of coolant. It's almost actually running out of coolant. We actually gotta add some if we're gonna keep moving it, but we're gonna just do this the mechanic way. Kind of lower the hood, halfway. There we go. And let's pull this car on the lift real quick. It runs, it runs. She's not having it. So the first thing with this car is, there's quite a bit of movement here. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of movement and it is, the upper ball joints completely shot. Now the brakes spin, but the only reason they uh, spin is because I have the lines clamped. These front calipers are completely seized. The lines look really bad. So we're gonna end up kind of rebuilding the front suspension. Minus the strut, surprisingly the strut is it's in decent shape, so I'm not worried about this one. Let's put it all the way up in the air and we'll kind of look at everything else. Yeah. 
Let's take a look underneath it. And the first thing is, let me show you those ball joints that are not looking extremely happy. I mean, this does not look too good. This ball joint is not looking very happy. And then we look at the other side. That also does not look very happy right there. That's not good. So we're actually going to go upper and lower ball joints. I don't know how old these lower ball joints are. They could be original knowing Toyotas. Of course, things are rusty. This is, after all, a rust belt car. And then we have mysterious power steering leak. I mean, it's, it's a pretty large leak and it's hard to see. Now, I don't want to remove this cover again, which was not very beautiful, but it is a power steering leak here. You can get a better shot at it right here. That is our source of the leak, that line right there. And this is a high pressure line. And the owner actually does have that line sitting in the back seat. Here is that beautifully rusted 7M oil pan. And then the other problem we have with this car is the clutch. Of course, these uh, slave and master cylinder, I'm surprised they're still holding. We had to bleed this one a lot, but it is leaking. See the fluid right there. That's gonna need replacement. Now, this is a W58 transmission. Manual transmission, this is not the same transmission as the one in the turbo model. This is kind of a lesser duty model of that. And then we look at the exhaust. This is, of course, the original exhaust, and I don't know you want to push on it too much. The shields are gone, but surprisingly, it is completely quiet. And that's, it is original up to this point where it is no longer original. And then uh, in the typical fashion of Mark III Supra, this is the first time I call it that, and Mark III is the third generation Supra, the, uh, that is no good. The center support bearing is just completely collapsed. They're not supposed to do that. And uh, this is super common. And what usually happens is you're driving, like you shift the gear a little abruptly, this start banging on the body, you hear like all kinds of noise. That is super common with these. Now something else that is not a huge issue. Again, this is not gonna be a cross country car. The output seal is leaking. There's a point where we have to draw the line and it's not a huge issue. And possibly I have my doubts is actually the top that is leaking where the shifter sits. Not a huge leak, not a huge issue. After all, this is an old car. It's not gonna be leak free. Now we look at other stuff like this uh, brake lines, all right? We wanna disturb them too much. They're not terrible, they are original. You can kind of see them through here, some of them in the fuel lines. They're not terrible. The only real rust in this car is right here. You got a little rot spot right here. That's probably the only real rust on this car. Otherwise, for an Illinois car, this is not bad at all. Because you look at the rest of the body, when we look here, there is really nothing. Same thing on the other side. There is really nothing and this spot is good. So I wonder if this other spot, if it was hit or something happened here, it's quite interesting. Only this spot, the rest of the body is fine. And here's a 1988 car we're standing underneath, lifted on the, on the lift. And I've seen probably 15 year newer cars with six times the rust amount. So we look at the back here, well, differential, obviously rusty, but no leaks, and that's kind of interesting. It shows you how these cars, in certain areas, they hold really well. Now, the th interesting thing about the rear suspension, I don't see any play. Everything is pretty solid for the most part. We have a little bit of play from this bushing right here. Nothing crazy. We were gonna want to address the main things first, which get this car running. Original struts, pretty interesting. They do have a small leak, but nothing excessive let's look at the other side right here this one is not leaking it's also original let's see this wheel has this wheel doesn't have any play so that's good now knowing mark three supras i can almost guarantee you that the rear subframe bushings are horrendous and this one is not looking very happy right here but Again, we're not trying to make this a road trip car. We're trying to get this car 
somewhat back on the road so his kid can learn to drive manual transmission within a budget. And this is the other thing with this car. We do have a budget. So the plan of action, and this is where we talk to the customer, we're not going to go all original parts. You can't even get original parts for most of this stuff. But we're not going to go premium parts and start modifying and start doing things. He wants this car to be a weekend car. Doesn't want to spend a ton of money on it, completely restoring the thing. But he wants it relatively drivable and safe. Safe is being the most emphasis. His son is going to drive it here and there, probably to high school and back, not really going to be driving it across the country. So the first thing we're going to start with is going to be the engine. We're going to do a head gasket. You know, we'll take the engine apart. I told him we might have to do some work to, on the cylinder head to the block. This is an iron block engine. So we'll do that. We're going to replace the master and slave cylinder on the clutch. The clutch is probably, I'll put it as midlife. It's not perfect, but it works. The brakes need a complete overhaul. We're going to put hoses. We're going to put calipers in the front. Probably going to be able to service the rear calipers, but we're going to put new pads and rotors all aftermarket, unfortunately, because you can't even get them originally, even if you wanted to. We're going to do that center support bearing, and we're going to do front upper control arm, which contains the ball joint and the lower ball joint, just to start, because I want to get this car driving. And this is, this is where I told the owner, I can't really know all the suspension stuff without really driving the car. And I am not going to drive this car when the front brakes are locked up. The only way for me to drive it is to kind of force the calipers open, clamp the line so we don't have front brakes. This is dangerous. I, you know, you can't just go driving a car like that and really test it, push on it, make sure the transmission works. So we're going to start this in stages. We'll see how it goes. You guys will join us once we eventually get all the parts for it. Because if you own one of these cars, parts are a problem or at least good, decent parts. Now, we're not going premium parts here, but decent parts are a problem for a car like this. They're getting older, original stuff, most of it is discontinued. So it's been kind of a struggle to get parts for these, but we're I'm trying to deploy all my resources here to get the best parts we can buy to stay within their budget. And I think this is gonna be a super fun project, at least for me. Hopefully you guys will enjoy it as well. And now you know what is the white Supra sitting in the back of the shop is here for. This stage, we're collecting parts slowly. They're coming in. And once we have all the parts, we'll start working on it. You guys will join us in that. And if the owner gives us permission, we'll actually film when the owner finally gives his car to his son. I think that'll be a beautiful moment. And I wish he allows us to film it and, and share it with you guys. Folks, I hope this video was somewhat helpful and informative if you are into these old Supras. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. And until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you have yourself a wonderful day.